Good morning, everyone, um, and good abend to our guests uh, who joined us from Germany. Thanks for tuning in into our webinar, Scaling Transatlantic AI, Berlin and Silicon Valley. Uh, my name is Mirko Wutzler. I am the VP um, of the GCC West, and I'm also going to be the master of ceremony um, for this morning's webinar. Uh, just brief on our organization, uh, the GC West is the official representation for German business here in the West, uh, and we facilitate market entry as well as innovation journeys and innovation trends for, uh, for uh, German industry and connect them with stakeholders. Um, we have a great lineup of experts and thought leaders mm -hmm. uh, and want to explore this morning how two of the leading AI ecosystems, Berlin and Silicon Valley, can join forces to scale AI solutions and take a deep dive into the status quo and outlook of both hubs. Um, and this event wouldn't be possible with great partners. Um, and I want to ask Mark Lendermann, who um, shared his uh, network with us in preparation of this event uh, and is the economic counselor of the German consulate in San Francisco. And I would ask him uh, to address us with some welcome remarks. So uh, please, Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, Mark, you're muted. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, my apologies. Two years into the pandemic and I still um, mute every time that I want to speak. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Mirko. Um, and thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to participate in today's event and to say some welcoming remarks. In my role at the German consulate in San Francisco, I often see the huge potential for cooperation between the Bay Area and Germany in the field of AI. And therefore, I'm so happy that Berlin Partner has taken the initiative to tap into this potential and to team up with the GACC West to bring together so many fantastic speakers today. Many thanks for involving me in that process. It's been my pleasure to connect the organizers with some of the fantastic speakers that we're going to hear from today. When we talk about leadership in artificial intelligence, we Europeans often focus on the role that legislation and regulation can play in the field of AI. And indeed, Europe is an important player when it comes to setting standards. Many rules set by the European Union have become the gold standard, followed by other lawmakers. For instance, the European General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, has influenced the Californian privacy legislation. And therefore, it is likely that also the rules governing AI that Brussels is going to set will have an impact beyond Europe's borders. In April of last year, the European Commission presented its proposal for a European AI Act. Germany supports this European AI Act and its multi-layered risk-based approach. For us, it's important that new rules are designed to be innovation-friendly and easy to implement, while at the same time safeguarding digital civil rights. But Silicon Valley should not look at Europe only as a regulatory powerhouse, but also as an economic powerhouse. The member states of the European Union are home to many innovative startups and companies in the field of AI. And Germany, and particularly Berlin, as its most important AI hubs, are very good examples for this. In Germany, we are on a good track in the area of AI. According to the Artificial Intelligence Index report that was recently published by the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, Ger Germany ranks third regarding AI skill penetration. According to the report, not surprisingly, the United States have led the world's overall private investments in AI companies. But Germany ranked only a very good fifth place with $1.98 billion invested. The federal government of Germany has adopted a set of measures to promote artificial intelligence in our country. Already in 2018, the government at that time adopted the country's first national AI strategy. In the meantime, the strategy has been updated. Nevertheless, there's still a lot of potential for Germany to accelerate its uptake of AI. With the new government having taken office just a few months ago, there's new momentum for political measures in the field of AI. The German government has significantly stead, stepped up its commitment to technologies like AI and will increase governmental, governmental investment for, in AI from three to five billion euros by 2025. Against this backdrop, 
I'm very optimistic that AI hubs such as Berlin will continue to see a very strong growth. And I'm convinced that this will provide a lot of opportunities for cooperation between startups from Berlin and companies from the Bay Area. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about today's panelists' perspective on this. And without further ado, I want to hand it over back to the organizers and to Nadine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for those uh, insight, insightful um... Uh, welcome remarks um, and I want to now turn it over uh, to our um, partners in crime from Berlin partner who helped us organize this uh, event this morning and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and ask Nadine Judas uh, to address us with welcome remarks she's the head of division digital business and startups at Berlin partner and so um, Nadine I want to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mirko, and thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, hello also from my side, hello from Berlin. It's a pleasure to welcome you here today. My name is Nadine Judith. Uh, I head the Department Digital Economy and Startups at Berlin Partner. We are Berlin's business development agency. We are Berlin's service provider for growth and innovation, and we support companies and investors in settling in Berlin and in their development at this, the Berlin location. So Berlin is Europe's most promis prom promising AI hub built on excellent research and driven by innovative startups and strong corporates. Last year, the city startup ecosystem saw with more than 500 funding rounds and 10 billion venture capital really record investments. We are very happy and feel privileged to have uh, so many entrepreneurs and experts in the field of AI coming to Berlin and taking on the challenge to start a company and innovate in the field of AI. Today, we are here to show and share what we are working on and to learn how to get even better in applying on scaling AI internationally. We also want to reach out to our transatlantic partners to develop and apply AI responsibly based on shared values and for the benefit of people and our planet. I also would like to kindly thank our great partners and supporters. First of all, the German American Chamber of Commerce West and Mark Lenderman from the German Consulate General San Francisco. And of course, a big thank you to all the great speakers and participants here. Thank you for your interest and your great support. I wish us all inspiring talks and great networking opportunities. Enjoy and thank you very much. And now I hand over to Mirko, probably. Yes, um, thank you for your warm words of welcome. And it was a pleasure to organize this with you and your colleagues. Um, and we will now come to our first um, highlight of the, this morning. And we'll hear from our keynote, Stefan Groschop. And we're really glad that he accepted our invitation. He's the founder and CEO of Automation Hero. And he will share his insights and how artificial intelligence will reshape the world of business. Um, and he has profound experience in the field. Uh, he has started his first AI company back in 1997 in Halle, Germany. Um, and he's a zero entrepreneur. He co-founded Hadoop, an open source platform that started the big data movement. Um, he also successfully founded Datamir, uh, raised 200 million of venture capital and led it to pre-IPO. And Datamir was processing 80% of financial data in the US. Uh, and his newest uh, venture is Automation Hero. Um, he raised 70 million uh, venture capital uh, with Automation Hero. And with his team, he built the world's best AI platform for document processing. And some of the customers include the German government as well as some of the leading and largest uh, insurance companies in Germany. So um, we're really excited to have you, Stefan. And um, yeah, I turn it over to you to um, listen to uh, your insights. Hey, thank you, Mirko. Um, I assume you guys can hear me okay and see see the slides. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's almost impossible to really um, go deep into the topic in just 15 minutes. I, I will try my very best and um, I couldn't be more excited to to be here to talk about this. Um, you know, for, for me, it's it's a little bit unreal. I left Germany because I was told um, I saw too many science fiction movies working on 
you know, data mining, as we called it, first in machine learning, big data, AI, and, and, and now we have, um, you know, events that are government supported. But I, I would love to give maybe the perspective um, from, from a startup, from an entrepreneurial perspective, as it, it's, and it sounds very great that the German government is stepping up. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity uh, and maybe also risk um, if we don't do it to to really accelerate um, our our effort there, um, AI will disrupt everything. And um, maybe people heard that before. Again, interestingly enough, I said it since decades. Um, but the growth in the industry um, is is just phenomenal. And it, uh, AI investment as well as technology um, is outpacing any other. Um, software industry ever. And the growth within the individual use cases is also outpacing anything that we saw in software ever before. So, and um, yeah, maybe you guys can already identify a little bit on the left-hand side that we have a viral growth curve here. Unfortunately, in the last few years, we had to learn what viral growth means. Um, but really, uh, there is an extraordinary acceleration, not just in the global investment and usage of AI technology, uh, but also in the way AI um, uh, grows itself. Um, I know we have great other speakers uh, lined up from OpenAI and such. Uh, AI is now outpacing Moore's Law, right? We all remember Moore's Law means every 18 months we double hardware capacity. Um, this is why we have iPhones we're talking to now and this and that. Um, but AI is now uh, doubling um, really it's performance every 16 months. And that's just extraordinary. And the problem is that people have a really hard time to understand that how fast the pace is. And um, putting that into context, um, um, Marco already uh, mentioned uh, before Germany invested 1.98, I think um, in, uh, in AI last year, but we should compare that with $53 million invested in the United States well, we need to compare that with the patents that are filed in Asia, specifically in China, um, which is aggressively turning into really the global powerhouse here and owning a lot of IP and we're really falling behind there. And as much I love consumer protection, uh, as much this is providing a, a extraordinary struggles for companies to then really catching up or really deploying AI. Um, we see that on a daily basis, um, as we getting in other countries, you know, tests and training data, what have you, for commercial products within weeks, it typically da uh, takes six months in Germany just to get uh, access to data in a company. Um, the reality, though, is, and I'm sorry if I'm I'm being the, the the negative voice here. I did not see any big company in Germany that I would argue is uh, GDPR compliant in the traditional sense. Everybody struggles with IT legacy and is really not where we, where we need to be. So on the one hand side, we have a lot of legal um, requirements now that slowing us down to accept AI. On the other hand side, I, I really don't think that the reality is as we think. And um, just creating the sense of emergency, um, uh, really investing into AI. I want to talk about the Kondratjev cycles. I'm not sure if you guys know about that, but Nikolai Kondratjev, a, a Russian economist, actually in the early 1930s discovered that with every innovation, we have an economy uh, cycle. And um, these cycles are actually accelerating. Actually, um, before him, uh, Schumperian, a, a German economist, uh, even in the 1920s, discovered uh, other things around that. It's worth to read about that. But these cycles are accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. Um, obviously, you know, this, this is also used to argument for singularity and what have you. And if I maybe compare and take a couple events here from the big data space, it actually the cycle for big data took roughly 13 years. We started Hadoop in 2005. 2018 really was the time when all the big data companies were sold off, um, you know, merged, the, the market went down, everybody had it, there wasn't anything to get there. And what's important to understand is if we go up on the cycle, AI, using AI um, or big data back then is a competitive advantage, right? And if we hit the peak, not having AI or big data back then is a competitive disadvantage. So now if we're looking at AI, um, TensorFlow, 
you know, again, just as like one defining event, which is the most commonly used AI platform in the market, um, was founded in 2015. So if we argue, okay, you know, the cycle is, you know, maximum 13 years because we know they're accelerating. Maybe it's just 10 years. Um, you know, and, and we started maybe with the school wave in 2015, we more than halfway through. So, and I think that's really what we're seeing. I think we see a lot of companies um, waking up in Germany to AI, um, but the train already left the, the station really. And I will double click on that in just a second. Just to give an, one example to make a little bit more concrete, AI can use uh, in many cases. Um, but I wanna highlight that a company companies' data, 80% of companies' data is unstructured. And that's a treasure chest that AI can help us to, to lift. And just to like put a soundbite out there, we helped one company within three months to make, um, to save 100 million, actually a Deutsche Bahn related supplier, um, to save 100 million in their supply chain within three months. Um, in, in that case, we didn't have to uh, train specific AI models and what have you, but the return of investment that you can get with using AI is just extraordinary. And again, unfortunately, we're really behind uh, in the adoption cycle in, in the European Union. What is important to understand, this is an iterative process. Uh, it's not that we bring in AI and, and again, there's a mindset problem Typically, it's very typical in Germany. You know, it's the discussion about why Mercedes or BMW is better than Tesla. And then one day they all wake up and, and have a, um, a record time build it car manufacturing uh, facility uh, in, uh, in Berlin, right? So it, it is iterative and it's moving very quickly. It's not AI comes in today and it will be, you know, the silver bullet solving all the problem. It's really there's different levels and iteratively AI is taking on more and more. The, um, you know, the killer use case for businesses in AI is obviously automation. So just a few recommendations. Um, this is more meant for people, for, for businesses in Germany that want to adopt AI. You know, it's maybe less for the startups that build AI products and so on. But um, again, I do think that Germans need a, a mindset change. I'm sorry, I used the German phrase here. Um, getting off the high horse uh, in Germany really means like w w it's, there's an attitude there um, where, again, just last week I had a call with a very big logistic company in Germany and the guy responsible like, oh, this looks too good to be true. It is true. And your competition in the rest of the world, if it's in Asia or in the US, are aggressively adopting these technologies It's you continue to sleep. In, and, and really not trusting the technology and see it as a risk or like, oh, it needs to be perfect before we try, before we use it and let's spend another 12 months to evaluate and what have you. So that needs to be very quickly a mindset change. And I really appreciate that it is becoming more of, an, of a topic and event like this shows that certainly. Um, it's all about getting into the game. Uh, it's an iterative process that I tried to say before. Um, and you either start today and start using this technology or again, there's a, there's a big risk of being disrupted. And again, car industry in Germany, and of course, as many people that still think the German car industry will survive this. But let, you, let me tell you, I've worked with car suppliers that basically had to go 80% of the people because you know cooling systems for cars is just nothing that people need anymore. And, and, and chip shortage now is hitting them even more. It is really, we, we risking with AI to, to really missing the train yet again. And it's imperative that there's a mindset in, for German businesses to start now, or they will be disrupted by international businesses outperforming them very quickly. I think it's too late. You know, some companies I see like, oh yeah, we will hire a data science team and then we'll build our own center of excellence. The train left the station. Go and buy ready to go tech that has, um, that has stuff to really catch up would be my recommendation. There is an enormous and beautiful and amazing AI companies in Germany. And it is shocking to me that German companies are still looking, for example, to US companies. I can, it, it is, I moved 17 years ago to Silicon Valley because I couldn't sell in Germany. Almost every company that we have in Germany as a customer I met in Silicon Valley because they come to innovation tours. What is like the most shocking thing, 
They don't trust local vendors that may be a little smaller, but they either look at these really big companies that potentially even disrupt their business. I mean, Amazon is getting into healthcare now in a, in a, in a shocking speed, into insurances, into everything. But they're just not willing to work with the, with the startups that are in Berlin, uh, where, by the way, we have our AI team as well. And, 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 and just these like regional companies that are just phenomenal and they understand the language by years. Um, AI is very, if you, if you work with natural language understanding, it's very language dependent. They have the training data set, they understand the local business, the legal requirements. But yet again, you know, they're looking for AI and then they come to Silicon Valley trying to find Silicon Valley companies or working with the big guys, shocking. Um, strong recommending, given the um, the absolute difficult situation with GDPR, which again, I acknowledge as an individual is a good thing and required, but the brutal reality is it's, it's just not real. It's something that it, there's an absolute disconnect between the technical reality in businesses today and what lawmakers think there, there really is, given that it's so difficult to you know, get training data on what, so, what have you, it is imperative to use pre-trained models and data by the way, which typically is from other countries and then translated. So that has implications that people need to understand. And if you have a chance, I would encourage you to support a university project or, you know, maybe we can build a German kind of open AI, open AI obviously being a phenomenal organization here in the Valley. And um, also if we want to catch up and not fall farther behind between global innovation and Germany, I think we need to start working more together Michael Nash, I'm sure you heard about him as a movie, A Beautiful Mind, um, you know, won a Nobel Prize for saying if companies actually collaborate, both um, of the companies that collaborate actually together get farther than if they would do individually. In Germany, there's still a mindset that we're just like, oh, no, I can't share data or ideas or this and that. Um, but it's really imperative if we don't want to fall behind. So on the don side, again, don't underestimate the speed of change. Um, Andres Norbert says software uh, will eat the world. I, I definitely would like to extend that and say AI will eat the world very quickly and absolutely disruptive. Uh, it doesn't make sense to hire data scientists today. Uh, the technology is getting commoditized. You will have point and click user interfaces. No reason um, to, to, by the way, you will not find them anyhow, because let me tell you as a company that spends millions of dollars on data science, they're extremely hard to find. And I would argue it might be even more attractive employer than you know, your regional insurance. So really, again, I would recommend to work with some of these beautiful startups that are in Berlin and the area around. Um, again, you will not find them. You don't have the data. You don't have the competency to run rather complex machine learning ops uh, environments and what have you. And another thing I wanna point out that I think is very dangerous is to share now again, create public data sets for the for the regional startups, uh, but be very thoughtful about sharing data with the big guys. Again, um, the devil's in the detail in the small print. If you put data onto any of the big cloud providers, um, or, or or use it with some of the big companies, you're basically just training their AI, making them even more powerful, and therefore, you know, cons maybe creating a competitor there. So I'm sorry, I only at 15 minutes, I feel I only scratched on the surface. Innovations in AI are extraordinary and, and the speed in which things move, if it's the innovations from open AI, uh, laughing face, there's so much uh, in the open from a research and the, the speed in which they improve. We are at the point that AI is delivering on many tasks better than humans. For example, in processing documents, renegotiating contracts, um, yeah, working on invoices, what have you. Um, and, and I'm really concerned that we're missing the train. I appreciate that we that in Germany, there's a $1.98 billion investment in AI, but contrasting that to the speed in which China is filing patents, or in which the speed the US is um, investing in that space. I'm, as, a, as a German that loves 
you know, uh, the region. I'm really afraid we, we're falling behind. So if anything, I hope I could create a sense of urgency this morning. Um, and I want to tip my hat to all the entrepreneurs that may be on the call. I know it's really hard to build AI companies in Europe and Germany due to legal limitations, due to the lack of funding, due to the lack of um, infrastructure and, and, and human resources. Um, there's absolutely a need of more, um, you know, skilled labor in Germany. Um, I know how hard it is, but I really appreciate uh, for all these startups and I encourage any company um, that maybe is on the look for AI competency, um, you know, don't go to Silicon Valley. I mean, maybe you find a company uh, that has likes on both sides, uh, we do, but there's just amazing companies in Berlin and um, thank you for everybody that's making it happen. Mirko, back to you. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing your expertise on the fast moving developments and your lessons and best practices. And we will now, um, and there's a lot happening in, in Berlin, there's great companies and uh, developing ecosystem. And so um, we want to now get an insight into two ecosystems and we will start with Berlin and uh, we have Philip Günther. Uh, he's an AI innovations manager from Berlin uh, partner and he will um, take us into the ecosystem and, and share his insights. Thank you, uh, Philip, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mirko. Uh, you should now be able to see my presentation, right? Yes. Perfect. Uh, well, let me jump right into what can only be a short appetizer today. Um, we see Berlin as the most international AI and startup hub and the most mature AI ecosystem in Germany, but also taking on a leading role in Europe. One out of five startups in Berlin was founded by international entrepreneurs. Almost half of the employees of Berlin-based startups have an international background and more than one third of the AI experts in Berlin come from abroad. It's a mature AI ecosystem built on excellent long-standing research. Um, in Berlin, you'll find two out of six national AI competence centers, the Bifold with a focus on basic research and um, the German Research Center for AI focusing on human-centric uh, human and applied AI. Now, these are just examples. I'll share our website later where you can find more information. It's an ecosystem driven by innovative startups and corporates scaling and applying AI innovation. Um, Brighter AI as an example of uh, a startup in the field of privacy tech with the mission to protect every identity in the public. Um, T-Labs as an example of how German and international corporates come to Berlin to benefit from its innovative tech ecosystem. And uh, one focus area here is on the application of AI in projects on open run, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and uh, 6G. Um, also the Federal Association for AI that represents the interests of AI companies on the federal level, and also helps connecting and strengthening the uh, European AI ecosystem. It's an ecosystem sparked by hubs that facilitate collaboration and networking. Um, the AI Campus Berlin by Morantix opened in April last uh, year. It's a not-for-profit space for research, startup, and co uh, corporates right in the heart of Berlin. And I'm very happy that we have its uh, founder, Rasmus Rote, here in our panel later. Um, the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, based in Berlin, it will serve as the global collaboration platform to prepare, detect, and respond to pandemic and epidemic uh, risks. And KI Park, it's a cooperation platform for German industry, um, like Volkswagen, um, science, politics, and AI startups uh, aiming to further promote the application of AI. It will open its doors on June 10, so just in a few weeks. Um, we also have internationally renowned signature events uh, finally back again, 
And next one up is the Rise of AI on June 8. Uh, it will also be streamed, so uh, you can expect a full day of insights into what's going on in the German and European AI ecosystem. So please make a mark in your calendar. You don't want to miss that. Uh, being the capital, Billion offers proximity to regulators and political actors, um, which will be increasingly relevant in light of upcoming EU AI regulation. And of course, we all want to see AI applied. Uh, we heard about this uh, earlier. So luckily, there are many players who facilitate transfer from research to solution, like the recently launched AI incubate and accelerator program Keats by the Berlin University Alliance, but also from solution into practice. So players who raise awareness for AI, um, specifically focusing on SMEs here. We're seeing improving infrastructure and resources and also outstanding AI professionals from around the world. As Berlin partner and in the cluster ICT, media creative industries, we foster and support the AI community. We help uh, connect them with players in other sectors uh, or clusters, and we provide greater visibility beyond Berlin's borders. Now, I said it's a mature ecosystem. I mean by that, that it's not dominated by one corporation or research institution or public authority, but rather a really diverse and dynamic uh, AI ecosystem with many exciting players who exchange ideas, uh, collaborate on eye level and uh, really bring AI made in Berlin forward. A critical factor here are the startups. Berlin is Germany's startup capital, but even more so Germany's AI startup capital. More than 40% of German AI startups are in Berlin. Um, a recent study uh, counts close to 300 startups here. However, many more have their AI development teams or individual experts working from Berlin. In fact, uh, Valley based uh, uh, Databricks just announced they're starting an R&D center, uh, increasing their Berlin based staff by a factor of 10. Um, there's a strong focus on B2B solutions. 80% of the AI companies in the capital region are active in this area, eight, uh, zero. Um, and looking at the areas of application, business intelligence, uh, health, mobility, uh, it's really uh, clear that trust is critical to success. Berlin has a strong focus here. There's excellent research in the field of explainable and responsible AI and startups that are putting those techniques into practice. Um, we've seen the uh, opening of the Center for Trustworthy AI intended to protect consumer interests. And uh, we are supporting a consortia of Charité Berlin, the TÜV Association, and many European partners in establishing EU testing and experimentation facilities for healthcare. That's an EU-wide initiative to ses, uh, test and certify AI systems for critical applications aligned with upcoming EU regulation and coordinated from Berlin. Uh, Dirk Schlesinger will be able to elaborate on this in the panel or our networking session. Now, we see the, uh, this as an opportunity to jointly co uh, collaborate uh, and contribute not only to a Berlin or German, but a European AI ecosystem. And from there to closely collaborate with our partners in the US and further develop AI responsibly and based on shared values. Now for news, events and success stories, please visit us online or join the conversation on social media. Coming up in June, uh, our AI recruiting campaign will promote Berlin-based AI jobs internationally so if you're interested, please reach out and we'll keep you posted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, uh, for taking on us on a tour through the um, exciting Berlin ecosystem. And now we turn it over and come 
to take a look at Silicon Valley. And uh, it's great that Eva Maria Olbos, operating partner at Point72 Ventures, has agreed uh, to also give a presentation on what's happening in the Valley, as well as uh, kindly agreed to moderate our panel this morning. Um, she has an impressive resume. Um, she's a part operating partner at Point72 Ventures, where she focuses on AI and machine learning and deep tech investments. She worked at the Boston Consulting Group, uh, the machine learning startup Newton, as well as the Microsoft Venture Accelerator in London. She has two master's degrees, one from the London School of Economics and one from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And so I, I'm excited to hear from her uh, what's happening over here and then uh, also uh, for the discussion in the panel. So uh, Eva Maria, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mirko. Also, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm really excited uh, to be here today uh, and really want to thank the organizers for making this event happen. Um, as a German working in Silicon Valley, I'm especially passionate myself about connecting the two ecosystems and events like these are absolutely paramount to making that happen. So thank you uh, for setting this up. Um, as Mirko mentioned today, I want to give you a bit of an overview of the global and especially Silicon Valley based AI ecosystem. But I thought the other um, potential insight that I could deliver as an investor in the US, uh, especially given that there are several entrepreneurs and founders in the audience, is to provide a, bit, provide a bit of an overview of what's been going on in Silicon Valley uh, from a general investor perspective uh, and some of the trends that you might want to be aware of um, as you are looking uh, to fundraise uh, and also connect with investors uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Starting uh, with the more uh, general introduction uh, to AI, so some of these numbers are not new to most people here, but the private investment in AI in 2021 totaled around 93 and a half billion US dollars, which is double the amount um, of the private investment amount we have seen in 2020, so a large increase there. Of that amount specifically for AI investments, around 56% or so is coming from the US, and within the US ecosystem, around 40% are currently generated in Silicon Valley. As most of you know, there has been a decentralization uh, in terms of access to capital in the United States given the COVID-19 pandemic, something I will go into a little bit more depth later on in this presentation. Um, in terms of uh, private investments, you'll just here see the illustration of how that trend has increased um, and especially what the increase has been between the years 2020 uh, and 2021. Um, we briefly heard about this earlier, um, but the leading uh, market in terms of investments is still the United States. We have seen tremendous growth from China in recent years. Uh, and of course, a lot of potential coming from the UK, Israel, and also Germany. So lots of exciting developments happening on a global stage. When looking at the market landscape um, of AI and machine learning in Silicon Valley, but also more broadly, we tend to differentiate between different uh, verticals and different categories, which I quickly want to address today. So in terms of horizontal platforms, we tend to look at NLP and computer vision. Of course, these tend to be um, uh, expanded every single year. We also have different vertical applications that uh, we tend to observe from an investor perspective. So looking at healthcare, financial services, uh, as well as industrial um, ML AI applications. We've seen a big increase in semiconductor space um, in recent years as well. And then of course, in autonomous uh, machines, which includes robotics and vehicles. Again, these categories are not set in stone and tend to develop and increase um, over time. But this gives you a quick market landscape overview of some of the biggest players right now um, in the US market. In terms of what we mean by AI and which specific subsectors are of biggest interest here, there are different development trends that we have observed in the last four to five years. Some of them are reflected here. So as you can see, there's been an above average growth in data management, processing and cloud. There has been an increase in industrial automation in medical and healthcare. Um, and some of these trends uh, will continue to grow over the next few years as well, as we're looking ahead in terms of AI applications and what will be most relevant going forward. I also want to say as an investor hearing, you know, different conversations um, in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, while AI and machine learning, of course, continues to be a leading topic. I mean, we saw the, you know, double figure um, growth from uh, 2020 to 2021. There's also a lot of other investment areas that have become uh, increasingly attractive uh, in Silicon Valley and most likely also globally. We're seeing more and more uh, talks as well as companies founded in the Web3 and DeFi space, FinTech, PropTech and DevOps among others, especially uh, over the last two years or so. 
giving a quick overview and taking a step back to tell you a little bit more about what's been going on in the investment landscape in Silicon Valley, specifically in the last two years, um, because 2021 has been a very unusual year, uh, to say the least, from a VC perspective. First of all, uh, we have seen a huge uptick in 2021 in both the amount of deals closed as well as the deal value closed, uh, specifically throughout the year of 2021. And it looks like this trend will also continue, um, at least uh, as we see right now in the first quarter going forward in 2022. Now, why is this happening? There's a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, we've had a lot of new non-traditional investors entering the, the space, meaning that um, conventional VCs now, in addition, have also private equity investors, institutional investors, as well as hedge funds that are providing VC capital money. Next, while we actually see, of course, uh, a big increase in supply of capital, um, and there's a lot easier um, you know, money in terms of, of founding opportunities, we actually see slightly fewer companies being founded. So as a result, we have a higher supply of capital, but overall a slightly lower demand for capital, which leads to an increase in the rounds um, that are being raised. And then of course, everybody here has heard of the great resignation. 2021 has been a very unusual labor market and especially in Silicon Valley, it is now more expensive than ever, not only to attract, but also to retain top engineers, top data scientists, specifically for AI startups. So a lot of founders that I have spoken to recently have told me that they are purposefully raising a larger series A or a larger seed round in order to be able to afford um, top talent in Silicon Valley, the US and also globally. We are seeing similar trends when it comes to mega deals. For example, 2021 has been exceptional there as well. Some of the AI mega deals that we have seen is for instance, uh, Databricks and Cruise. And also uh, looking at exit data, here we're seeing some uh, differences as well. Some of the AI um, biggest uh, exits are UiPath as well as Roblox. But perhaps the most surprising um, in terms of uh, trends that we have seen uh, in Silicon Valley, um, and especially also in the AI ecosystem, is how much the average pre-money valuation has increased um, over the course of 2021. Um, we are now looking at a you know, pre-seed pre-money valuation of over $10 million. And in Series A, we're looking at $100 million. That was pretty much unheard of before the year of 2021. We are seeing a slight decrease here um, as we enter 2022, uh, mostly because public markets are down, but it's just something that I thought I'd share. It's something that everybody is currently talking about and could potentially be relevant to the founders and entrepreneurs uh, in this audience as well. And then of course, another big trend in 2021, as well as the year previous, is the decentralization of access to capital across the US. Um, you can see some statistics here. So for example, Miami, which has established itself as an NFT hub, has actually experienced over 300% year over year growth uh, in terms of deal value. We're seeing similarly large increases um, in Philadelphia, for example, in Austin, in Denver, um, as well as several East Coast hubs. Having said that, the Bay Area um, still has experienced 190% year over year growth. So the existing uh, hubs are not going away. And this graph also exemplifies that. So we are still seeing uh, more than half of funding coming from the Bay Area, New York, LA, and of course, Boston, with, which has established itself as a biotech hub. Now looking ahead, uh, just a few uh, quick anecdotes here. So as I briefly mentioned, we are expecting a bit of a slowdown in 2022 given global markets. So we don't think that there will be a repeat of 2021, but we're still expecting investments in AI to continue to grow very rapidly and reach approximately 100 billion globally in 2022. And in terms of some of the AI trends to watch in 2022, just from some of the conversations that I have had recently, it's really, really hard to pick some. Um, I really had to narrow it down. But um, what I've been hearing a lot um, in the investment landscape um, over the last few months is first of all, an increased focus and also an increased investment area on ML operations. So actually making sure that the production of ML is being run efficiently and effectively. 
large language models um, are becoming increasingly hot, uh, which is essentially an algorithm or a system that enables the, to detect the interoperability between paragraphs, phrases, sentences, etc. Generative AI, which is essentially machine learning systems that can generate their own content, uh, be that text, image, um, or video. And then there is also uh, finally and thankfully a uh, increased uh, discussion here in Silicon Valley about the need to remove bias and having more stringent AI ethics implementations. And I'm very excited uh, to discuss any of those topics in more depth offline. So this is just a quick overview of what's been going on globally in AI, but also specifically in Silicon Valley from an investor's perspective. I would love to connect with anyone on this topic if you're interested, you have my email address here and thank you so much. So we will uh, move right on to the panel discussion. Uh, we're running a little bit late, uh, but uh, probably we can add uh, five more minutes at the end to the allotted time. And so, um, yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to ask our, uh, all our panelists uh, to join us and also Eva Maria uh, to take it over and lead us into the panel discussion. Perfect, thanks so much, Mirko. Very excited for the panel today. We have some really, really tremendous panelists that will be joining us. Um, before we kick it off, I just want to uh, provide a reminder that you can always share any questions that you have in the Q&A function here in Zoom. Um, I will leave about 10 minutes at the end of the panel for any questions coming from the audience. Before we kick it off, I just quickly want to introduce our panelists. Um, we have four different people joining us today. First, there is uh, Shilpa Kolaktar. Shilpa leads the Global AI Nations Business Development at NVIDIA, and she's responsible for driving the adoption and also growth of NVIDIA's accelerated computing and AI platforms and solutions across the public sector. In her previous role, Shilpa was a manager of the collaboration solutions at Cisco Systems. She holds a bachelor in computer science and an MBA from the San Jose State University. Thanks so much for joining, Shilpa. Next up is Zach Kass. Zach is the head of go-to-market at OpenAI. OpenAI is an AI research and deployment company with the mission of ensuring that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. Previously, Zach worked at BrightFunnel to lead the growth of the sales and customer success teams. And before that, he was a director of enterprise sales at Mixpanel. Zach has MBA from the University of California in Berkeley. Thanks so much for joining, Zach. Next up is Rasmus Rote. Uh, Rasmus is the co-founder and CTO of Berlin-based Nerantix, the world's first venture studio for AI and co-initiator of the AI Campus Berlin, which we've already heard a little bit about at today's event. Uh, Rasmus is also a renowned deep learning researcher, and he has published over 15 academic papers on deep learning while attending Oxford, Princeton, and ETH Zürich. In 2019, he was featured on Forbes 30 Under 30. He's also a founding board member of the German Association of AI. Thank you, Rasmus, for joining us. And last but, not, me. Thank you. last but not least, uh, Dirk Schlesinger. Dirk is the Chief Digital Officer at TÜV Süd, where he is in charge of developing a digital strategy and establishing a global digital service function. Since January of last year, he is also the Chief Orchestrator of TÜV AI Lab, which has set itself the task of defining the technical and regulatory requirements that AI entails. Before TÜV, um, Süd Dirk spent 11 years at Cisco. He is an aerospace engineer by training and also holds an MBA from the University of California, Berkeley and a doctorate in mathematics from the Universität Mannheim. So incredibly impressive speakers today. And um, I want to thank you in advance for taking the time uh, for the discussion and answering some questions. To kick it off, um, I just wanna ask a bit more of a general question, which is what is one of the recent AI trends that has fascinated you personally? And also potentially, how has that changed over the COVID-19 pandemic? Are there any recent developments um, that you have observed? Um, perhaps, um, Rasmus, would you like to kick it up? Sure, I think, I mean, like some of the stuff you already mentioned, I think with generative models is something I'm also truly passionate about because so far I think we have been mostly focused on AI applications and practice in terms of building companies that basically analyze data. And, and then basically make predictions. And now we come into this age where we can also actually use models to generate content, which is obviously also a large part of the economy. If you think about you know, content creation, if you think about anything in media marketing uh, and many other applications. So I think that's very exciting. 
also very excited about anything that's related to science at the intersection of basically AI and, and, and deep sciences like biology, which is also something I guess with COVID and the vaccines and also some progress of some of the um, you know, large research institute and companies has, has, really, has really progressed well. So these are certainly things we're excited about. Um, I think with COVID, um, a few you know, things are becoming more digitized, which ultimately um, helps to have also more data in a digitized format, which uh, helps for, for training AI models. Which is good. I think we've also seen with our radiology business that, uh, as remote work is more common, you know, working for example in a teleradiology model is something that is even more common now than a few years ago. So yeah, I think generally, um, you know, obviously there's been some bad developments with COVID overall, but uh, towards AI, there's certainly some 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 things that it help, has helped for. Perfect. Thanks so much for sharing. Shilpa, I would love to hear a little bit more about your viewpoints and your observations. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with the th things that uh, you and Rasmus highlighted in terms of the large language models. Um, I do see that um, some of these are uh, going to start making the metaverse a reality because uh, you know so far, and we've seen in sci-fi movies all of the virtual worlds and people being interactive and all that. But it's starting to happen. And the reason I see that the metaverse and this whole presence of a, a virtual digital environment where people are working, learning, playing is going to be uh, starting to be adopted is because the next generation, such as my son, um, who is 10, um, is very comfortable in the virtual world, having a virtual avatar. Um, so that's one thing that I see um, uh, in the future trends that's going to become a reality. And the other one is the low code and no code um, AI, where software is writing software. Um, AI is designing the next best chip. You know, so those kinds of um, uh, trends is what I'm uh, really excited about. That sounds great. Could not agree more. And I love um, having a little bit of a data point from the younger generation as well and hearing what, you know, is top of mind for your son. So thanks so much for sharing. Uh, Dirk, would love to hear a little bit more about your observation and something that has excited you in the AI space most recently. Yeah, thanks. But I think there's a convergence for generative models. I mean, I've got a math background and one thing that really excited me that now there's AI assisted mathematics, not just in terms of like analyzing big data sets, that's kind of old school, but now really kind of uh, like AlphaGo and playing Go, AI is helping mathematicians to find connections where human the human mind maybe cannot spot them so easily. So this is just like a bit maybe out of, out of whack right now. Uh, but I think there's more to come in that space where we go from this like, you know, correlation into to more like, you know, reasoning. So generative models can be big. Um, and uh, the second thing, and we already had it from Shilpa, uh, the fusion of language generation with image recognition. That's going to be a new thing in terms of how we interact with AI. Um, and it just kind of appeals to two senses, not just the one sense we have. And I think these two things we need to be watching going forward. Sounds great. Thanks so much for sharing your viewpoints there. Um, and Zach, I'll hand it over to you. would love to hear your thoughts as well. I think I'm um, unfairly biased, but Dolly, I, I came to OpenAI and knew it as a large language model uh, company and, uh, and robotics to a certain extent. Um, Dolly was, was not something that I think was on most people's radar. Dolly 2 has certainly made uh, image generation and text image generation a, a very real um, thing and I think it's a really bad time to be a deep learning critic um, because it, it, it's sort of where, where there are a lot of critics being proven wrong so I think uh, generally the the massive uh, momentum that we're we're seeing in deep learning and uh, image generation uh, as a category sort of exploding um, really like right in front of our eyes Sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Certainly something that I've heard uh, a lot as well in more recent conversations. So interesting to see that we share some observations there as well. Um, maybe next, I want to turn it on. You know, we talked about some of the potential and some of the opportunities in the AI space, but there's of course also uh, challenges and also fairly common pitfalls um, that founders uh, may be facing. So whoever here um, has something to share, I'd be curious to hear what some of those common pitfalls are um, that founders encounter as they are starting a company in the AI space and what they can do to navigate those challenges. 
please feel free to um, provide any insights um, if you want to share directly. I mean, I can, I can, I can kick it off. I think um, maybe, maybe two things. So first of all, um, really understanding the workflows of your customers. I mean, in a lot uh, AI solutions in the B two B space are around, you know, you taking an existing workflow and supercharging it with AI, and often a human is for good reasons still in the loop. And um, I think what we also underestimate for some of our companies is that if you want to change the workflow of a person who has worked in that workflow like tw for twenty years, um, you you can't just change it completely from one day to the next one. So you really need to think carefully like how to adapt the workflow and if for example in our medical imaging example, instead of just showing a lot of bounding boxes on an image it's maybe better to rather you know pre-filter triage the cases or build a safety net around it instead of just you know blasting predictions and then like having having a workflow that really doesn't work for the people and also doesn't lead an improvement so to, to overcome that pitfall it's really important to you know really sit next to the customers or potential customers and really just watch them and see how they work every day and see what their workflow is and then then think about changing it and, and not going the other way around um, and the second thing is i guess there's luckily a lot of tools out there a lot of models out there so really make sure you don't reinvent the wheel there's so much you can plug together and obviously some is the core ip of the company but don't spend time on things you sh don't have to build yourself either through open source or using external services which ultimately also gives you the benefit that you don't have to maintain them as yourself and there's somebody else basically um, for the developing and you can just plug it in. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing, Osmos. Any other, other uh, recent experiences um, that the panelists have come across when working with founders or maybe even having been a founder themselves in a previous life? Yeah, I, I could offer one here and I recognize the very parochial view. And 10 years ago, I had my own startup and long story short, we, we tried to design a discrimination-free, uh, cross-platform, cost device uh, uh, thing for home automation. And uh, where eight people were happily plugging along, coding, uh, enlisting, launching customers. And then one thing happened, our one of our biggest customers at the same time, shareholders came and said, guys, if you want to want to do business with us, you need an ISO 9001 certification. Do you have it? Mm -hmm. And of course we didn't, we had other things to do. We had no money, no resources. Uh, and it almost killed us because what we didn't do in the beginning, we didn't start documenting our processes, uh, what we did early on. And then when it came on to us or came upon us, uh, we're scrambling to make it happen. So the only thing that we can advise, and even it's like totally boring stuff like job descriptions and process documentation, if you set up a process, if you set up a company and a product, start collecting the information early on because there will be the point you go to market, you will need it. We learned that the hard way. We almost failed that way, um, but that's something you know. I, I still I'm still traumatized by it, and that, that's not the reason I joined TUF, But it's just one thing which I still do remember. Very interesting. One of the things you might not always think about, um, but has incredible technical debt, so to speak, later on in the process. So appreciate you sharing those insights. Um, is there anything else on founder learnings and pitfalls? If not, I would like to continue the discussion. Um, and what I would really like to touch upon a little bit more um, is the topic of AI ethics. And uh, Zach, I thought it would be really great to get your opinion here. So OpenAI's mission, um, as previously mentioned, is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. So um, in your opinion, what, one, what can we do as, as founders, as researchers, as investors to ensure that there is an equitable AI ecosystem? Yeah, I think... Um... I think that the, there are probably two things. Uh, there's a um, there's a responsibility by the by the companies building AI to agree to safety standards, and that is happening. Um, and it's um, it's a bit of a prisoner's dilemma because in a in a rush to build a commercial application and to prove commercial viability, there's a tendency in many cases historically to skip steps. And so it's imperative that um, the other constituent in the market, the, the, the buyer of services, also hold the, the, the vendors accountable to safety. So I think um, we constantly remind our customers um, that we're going to hold them to, to safety standards. Uh, and they you know, should also, in turn, hold us to safety standards. And I think um, the other most important thing that we can do is talk about um, safety and ethics in AI and OpenAI obviously has taken a pretty 
um, forward leading uh, uh, place in this. Sam talks a lot about um, the importance of um, alignment, and this is not something new in this industry, but aligning the models to uh, humans' interests. Um, I think lastly, the um, as the market develops, we need to be really, really cautious about rushing products to market. Um, and there needs to be a general understanding that um, the uh, we need to be very careful about uh, who we put in, in or what we put in whose hands uh, and on what timeline. OpenAI gets a lot of flack for holding on to products that we that we launch um, maybe too long, but there's a really good reason that we that we do that. Really interesting points. And I especially appreciated uh, your observation on putting the onus back on the buyer as well of AI, right? Not just the producer, so to speak, or the supplier, but also the actual consumer and customer um, of that application. To the extent that you are able to share, um, do you have a, a recent example where that has worked uh, successfully? Uh sure. I'll I'll use we'll use Acme Corp as an example. So if Acme Corp comes to us and says, hey, we, uh, we really want to work with you, OpenAI, but you're holding us to a standard that we don't necessarily uh, think is fair in terms of safety or, or um, application. We're going to use this uh, open source model. We say, okay, you, you, there's fine that we can't, we can't stop you from doing that, but perhaps we can tell you why we think that's actually also irresponsible. Um, and I think that that's probably somewhat, I mean, conversations like that are, are fairly unprecedented because we, stuff like this is, you know, is, is pretty new. Um, but we think that those conversations are, are helpful and important. And in a world where ultimately our customers are rational, good actors, I mean, most enterprises, most corporations are good actors and they want to perform well on the, you know, as, as corporate citizens. Most of them don't actually know enough about AI to be a responsible uh, party, and 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 what they, they think when they take some off the shelf open source model that it that it is perfectly aligned, that that it is perfectly safe, and that that's not always the case. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing, Zach. Um, Shilpa, I'd love to uh, ask you a question. So, in your role at Nvidia. Um, you see a lot in terms of, you know, the opportunities, but also the challenges of larger corporates, organizations adopting um, AI. And you also specifically work with the public sector and public sector agencies. Could you share a little bit of what you see? What is holding corporates as well as public sector agencies back right now in adoption to AI? And also on the flip side, what are some of the um, opportunities that you see? in terms of adoption. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, I mean, this came up earlier, um, specifically in the terms of, um, you know, uh, the AI strategy. It's so important to have a solid AI strategy and congratulations to Germany, which has um, published a strategy and kept developing and adding to it, uh, evolving it, right? And uh, so, but that's once your vision is set and the roadmap is set, it's really important. Another ingredient that's important is the policy and regulations to address some of the things that Zach and you were discussing in the prior question, um, which sets that required checks and balances in order to achieve those outcomes, right? Um, but um, I'm with NVIDIA and I work uh, very closely with government agencies and public sector. And so I have come in conversations with these organizations, I've come to the realization that there are two more very essential ingredients required for successful AI adoption. Um, one is the ecosystem. Um, ecosystem of um, AI companies, startups, skilled people, um, researchers, um, the triangulation between government, higher education and universities and industry. And the second element is the infrastructure. Um, it is starting to become very well known that um, uh, supercomputing is uh, an essential foundational element um, for processing AI, for processing data, for developing those computational models. Um, and hence, it's become the new driver of economic growth and industrial innovation um, to uh, bring about you know, the top of mind priorities for governments, which are public health, national security. A lot of use cases bubbled up during the pandemic, including supply chain logistics and public health. Um, so yeah, in my opinion, I think um, it's um, really uh, the uh, paying attention, governments paying attention to 
not only having a strategy and government and uh, governance and policies, but also looking at building that AI ecosystem and having the foundational infrastructure, the compute infrastructure is important. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, some very insightful uh, and actionable insights uh, to take away here. And Shilpa, you mentioned, uh, you know, regulation um, earlier as well, as well as the need uh, for a structure. So um, I'd love to uh, hear a little bit more on this topic as well uh, from Dirk. Um, Dirk, you actually shared, you know, your ISO um, <laughs> experience early on in the panel. Um, and also given your current uh, position uh, at TÜV Süd, um, and the TÜV AI Lab, um, you know, you have a lot of different responsibilities that are directly related to establishing standards and regulation in order to ensure, you know, safe applications um, of artificial intelligence. What are some of the learnings uh, that you have generated in your role today? So, Stefan said there is a sense of urgency, and I think uh, what we do not want to have is, is, is a second uh, Data Protection Act, where you know it was imposed on the industry, and we're still struggling to make that happen. So the question now is how we can we make it better? Um, and as you may know, the EU has published the EUI Act in I think April last year, and give or take a few years, I think it will take I don't know three years, four years for the whole thing uh, to become valid and be be implemented. But the AI Act is not very prescriptive in terms of what do we have to look at to be compliant? It says there needs to be a third party for high risk applications. And you have to look at these things like robustness and transparency and explainability, and that's it. So, so we're still, I mean, we are, that is the, the, uh, the developers and the users of AI, as well as the regulator or the testing, uh, the testing and inspection companies like TÜV, we're still sitting there saying, well, now, how do we go about this? And what do we actually kind of look at uh, to be compliant? And, and one thing, but that's my personal vision, which is not necessarily shared by everybody, is that we have to take the approach we have in software development or like you know, a scrum approach to certification. So we cannot wait until the product is finished. And then you know that the friendly TIFF person comes and looks at your product, then we say, now we're gonna certify it. Uh, that's not gonna work because with AI, you basically define the product early on by asking the question, by you know, uh, sourcing your data, by the whole data wrangling, by you know, taking part the algorithms, the training process, you know that much better than I do. So the, the big question we have as, a, as, a, as an industry, as maybe also the regulator, how can we design an, ag an agile certification process? Mm -hmm. and, and one approach would be, and again, this is just, you know, a uh, working hypothesis. If we look at different quality criteria of AI, I personally put them in four buckets. One is basically, you know, the, the son or the daughter of ISO 9001. It's a process quality audit where you say, did I, you know, pay proper attention to structure my process document, where the data is coming from? That's something which we all know from, you know, good soft development. So anything going towards certification of that one is basically an, an extension, an extrapolation of things we already know. Mm -hmm. The second bucket, and that's now where the TÜV comes in, is where from other norms and standards, whatever, ISO 26262 in the car industry, it sets functional safety in cars, you know? What are you supposed to be doing as a car not to hurt, to hurt people? Mm -hmm. There we can take a norm and basically translate it into requirements for an AI system. Um, 99.99% whatever you have to recognize moving objects on the street or whatever, you know, there, there's basically a, it's not easy, but you can translate requirements from an existing norm into a new requirement. Also not so hard, harder, but not so hard. The third one is um, explainability, which is something the UI Act requires. There we're still struggling from a science perspective, how we nail that down, how we quantify it. Now that's, I think, where uh, science has to take place and, you know, hard thinking has to take place going forward. And we already touched on ethics. Um, that's even harder. There we have to involve the society and the politicians and the, you know, the, the people per se to discuss what are the ethical requirements for an AI. So what is a, a result of an AI system which the society deems as ethical and what not? And we all recognize, even within Europe, you know, um, ethical standards do differ. These are my four buckets. I think one and two can deal with relatively easily. Three, science needs to happen. 
for there has to be a political discussion. And that's what we have to make happen within the next three years. Very interesting. Um, who do you think would be the right political agents to take on uh, your fourth bucket and uh, making sure that this actually gets implemented from a political standpoint? I can only give you an impression of what I see right now. We have a vibrant dialogue um, of universities and, and the different political entities here in Germany. Um, we have the Normus Roadmap KI, that's the, it's hard to translate, you know, one of these typical German things, there is a roadmap for norming and, and standardization of artificial intelligence. Um, working groups are dealing with these questions and they do it in, in a domain specific way. So medical is different from whatever industrial because B2C, B2B are, are different. Um, I think there's not one place. It has to be a much broader uh, a discussion that has to take place also involving um, stakeholders and the public. There has to be stakeholder dialogue because otherwise, um, what I would been saying that comes back to the speed argument, uh, without um, uh, understanding and acceptance, AI will not become mainstream, at least not in the long run. So we have to work on this acceptance part. And for that, we have to involve, you know, the, 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 the broader uh, society here. Sounds great. Thank you for um, elaborating that. And, you know, I think you you brought up uh, a few times uh, just now, uh, really the essence of this panel, which is, uh, you know, the two sides of the Atlantic in terms of scaling AI, understanding the opportunities uh, in, you know, Germany, um, broader Europe, as well as the United States. Um, so I'd love to turn it over uh, to Rasmus here because uh, he is an investor who, you know, directly connects both ecosystems, who has worked with founders as well as investors on both sides um, of the Atlantic. So Rasmus, I'd be curious to hear what are some of the recent trends that you've observed on both sides of the Atlantic? And also in your opinion, what are the core strengths of each ecosystem? What can they learn from each other? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe also to kind of quickly follow up before that on what Dirk said and the others, because okay. I think there are a few very important points. I think we really need to paralyze this whole process more in terms of regulation. So, and that's why what what also um, uh, Shilpa said, like we need to bring the ecosystem together because like from day one, when we develop a product, like we shouldn't, you know, develop the product, get investment, try to work on it and then realize three, four years later, like regulation, like the regulator says, look, and we shut it down. So we need to bring them all on the table on day one. And so that's, I mean, one of the reasons also why we launched the AI Compass to really have them all in kind of one space and talk to each other. Because I think that's one of the biggest problems, actually, at least in, in, in Germany right now, also that, you know, all the ethics people like talk about their their things and write papers. Then there are all the startups that have their own like story. Then there is all the researchers, there are all the big corporates and they're all kind of do their own things, but they don't really talk that much to each other. And I think, there needs to be more exchange because also people use different terminology for the same things. And um, that I think would make uh, things just much better. And the second thing is, I I think one problem in Europe we have, and maybe also indirectly reflecting to your question is that we always talk about risks of AI. And I mean, I agree there are a lot of risks, but there's also a lot of risk of not using AI. So, I mean, you know, talking healthcare, talking mobility, like, you know, there are people dying um, because humans make mistakes. So um, I think at least in Europe, I think I'm, I, get, I find it really sad that we always have this negative narrative around uh, the use of new technologies. And I think we should flip it around and be rather think about, okay, what, what are actually the upsides? Like, why should we use the technology? Because that's the ultimate reason why we do this all, right? Like, because we think it makes our lives better. So let's put that first. And let's also say, look, like if we don't use AI, uh, there are actually some pitfalls. And then, but then at the same time, think about, okay, now what, what of the parts do we need to regulate? And that's, that's clear that there needs to be regulation. And that's also maybe a misunderstanding that, you know, it's not about AI practitioners don't wanting regulations, it's about them wanting clear regulation. Like the worst thing for me is like uncertainty, right? Also towards our customers when they're uncertain if they can use this product because the regulatory text was written for like some hardware products or, you know, some not like even for software and now you're coming with AI. So any regulatory certainty, even if it's a bit more narrow and requires more documentation, I'm fine with that as long as there's clarity. And I think we only get this clarity if all these stakeholders were closer together and work very pragmatically and think about upsides. So just on that, and I think that's kind of also the narrative shift we maybe need to do in Europe, um, which I think is a bit different in the US. It's a bit more positive in, in that sense. Um, I think what, 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 what we see is that there's a global convergence in terms of you know talent working from everywhere. Um, so I think so far salaries have been cheaper and for example, like Berlin as compared to the Valley, but I mean, that's also increasing a lot right now. Um, because people in Berlin now work for Valley companies and Valley companies opening office here. So 
I think it's converging at the same time investors also like UEFA, I mean, are investing now globally doing tickets via Zoom. So I think we see like a very nice global convergence also within the US, within Europe. And I think that is, I guess, also effect of COVID, which I think makes the ecosystem hopefully a bit more similar, um, which I think will be good for, for the European ecosystem. And maybe also some parts um, where, where the US ecosystem can learn from, from the German in terms of, um, or the European in terms of, you know, regulation and, and kind of some of the risk and the ethics discussions. Yeah, that's that sounds uh, really good and good to hear. And I've, I have heard similar um, opinions on, first of all, convergence, but also to your point on, uh, you know, as there are more ethical as well as regulatory questions uh, in Europe, often startups and founders are highly adaptable. And it's a core strength that they have, um, first of all, developed themselves, but also use those as they enter new European markets, um, which are, of course, extremely different depending which country you're in. So really appreciate you sharing that. Rasmus, and maybe one a quick follow-up question is a bit more general on, uh, on investment trends. So I know you spend a, a lot of time both in Germany with Merantix, but also in the US. Um, have you seen some differences in the recent technologies um, as well as you know, founders that you've spoken to uh, in terms of the technologies that are being developed there? Yeah, I think there's a few, like in, in the European ecosystem or the German, I think there's a few industries or verticals where we, you know, there's an advantage to build uh, stuff in Europe. So if you think about, um, I don't know, anything related to manufacturing, um, potentially even automotive, um, some of the more hardware related AI companies, I think there's a competitive advantage. Um, also in some of the healthcare domains, there's um, quite nice um, data. There's also quite a few pharma companies, chemical companies. So I think some of these areas like, um, there's an advantage in Europe. Um, I think what's a bit more challenging or what we've seen a bit more challenging is anything that is a bit more horizontal, like some of these MLOps type companies that sell initially to startups, um, you know, adopting these solutions, like just because the startup ecosystem, especially that would use such applications, is just much smaller in Europe. So um, there's a much smaller adoption base and kind of the core group is in the US and there are much more startups that are easily adopting those solutions. So we feel like some of these companies are a bit harder to build maybe in Europe. Got it. Makes makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing your opinions. And also I want to just open it up to um, anyone else here on the panel to the extent um, that you have, you know, for example, you or Dirk or anyone else has worked in different geographies in the US versus uh, different geographies, any learnings, any experiences that you have had. Um, I think uh, the audience would really benefit from hearing from you directly. Yeah, I would um, like to add um, in terms of just some of the um, key ingredients for success um, in AI are being with NVIDIA, we do a lot of um, joint research with universities. So I think expanding that university and industry or private sector partnership around research um, is important. Um, also having, um, with, because I'm with public sector, you know, it's uh, great when, um, cities, states, they invest in some kind of a test sandbox, um, you know, and collect initial feedback from citizens, from people who are getting impacted by those kinds of AI applications. Mm -hmm. um, and um, really uh, what, what Dirk mentioned is advancing that science and the research around explainable and trustworthy AI. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, there's uh, lots of research happening there. NVIDIA is also working in that space of figuring out models for um, explainable AI. So uh, it's exciting. I think it's going to evolve further. Very exciting. Thanks for, for sharing, Shilpa. And is it possible for you to share a little bit around, uh, you know, you've worked obviously with the public sector across multiple, multiple international governments, any uh, experience there, uh, specific interaction with the public sector, or you mentioned research agency earlier as well, right? Research university. Um, what are some of the things that have worked um, in your work at NVIDIA? Yeah, um, so we uh, have a lot of partnerships with universities in different verticals. So health, healthcare um, came to the forefront um, because of the pandemic in the past couple of years. And so we have uh, worked with these universities, uh, not just in terms of the research, but also the actual application of that to real hospitals. And um, a technique which has come about uh, due to our research, as well as the industry, um, you know, uh, all of the other players in this space is federated learning. And so we are starting to see how the industry and how actually people are going to start benefit 
from this new um, technology called federated learning, where you uh, train a model um, on data sets from multiple organizations, yet keeping the data privacy um, you know, intact with, with the organizations that own the data. So I think um, public sector um, governments should really take advantage of these kinds of tools. AI is just a tool after all, and they should start taking advantage of these kinds of tools um, to bring about the positive impacts. As Rasmus mentioned, there's lots of benefits out there and we should really, instead of hindering them, start looking at how can we use AI as a tool to start benefiting from that. Perfect, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, very interesting. And I just uh, saw that there's a question that came through from the audience. A reminder that if you have any questions to our panelists, feel free to post them uh, in the chat here in Zoom. This question, I feel like uh, Zach can potentially help us with. I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on it. So the question is, if data fund fundamentally underpins AI and its impact for users and utilization globally, what is the panel's thoughts on how we standardize the permissions rights for data? And the analogy that's been used is, you know, we standardize electrical output in homes and work with the use of an adapter. So we don't cook our electrical devices. So how do we do this for data? Uh, it's a great question. I think you could, we were talking about this the other day. I think you could easily imagine a world where there are standards for the data that, you know, a scale or a label box produces um, such that the uh, training data is conforms. I think you could also imagine a world where the output is standardized and you know we worry less about the data. Um, I think that the, the bigger problem seems to be right now that it's less about standardizing data and more about, you know, in the pursuit of AGI, do we have enough? Can we can we actually create enough data and less about, you know, is it is it is the data safe? Assuming that we, you know, we all want to achieve AGI. Um, but uh, yeah, I think certainly either the data that goes in or or the or the results will have to will have to conform to to standards, and my guess is that we we move the standard further downstream. That makes a lot of sense. Any other panelists uh, who has some experience or uh, opinion to provide on this topic? I, I would guess that there's not necessarily standards for the data per se, but uh, how you document data and how you make them graspable and describe them. And there's, there's you know, it's called, what is it? Uh, data sheets for data sets has been a recent uh, published paper. I think Microsoft did that. Where at least there's a taxonomy, how you describe data and its provenience. I think that's a start where you can basically put your arms around standards. Now, of course, every algorithm is different, needs different labeling, different data sets, but at least you have a certain procedural process, standardized process, how to describe it. And that makes call it quality assurance much easier. Excellent. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, another question that has popped up a little bit early in this panel discussion, and potentially, Shilpa, this is somewhere uh, where I would love to hear your opinion, given your work with the public sector, is um, are there any insight into uh, AI in the defense sector specifically? So um, there is a question around, are there differences between the US and Germany? Um, so any other panelists that can maybe provide a German perspective would be interested in as well. But Shilpa, to the extent that you have worked uh, and have any uh, you know, thoughts on what prevents startups potentially working with the defense sector. Do you need a certain stamp of approval? Um, would be really interesting to hear your opinion on this topic. Yeah, I mean, there are um, uh, vendors who need to have certain certifications in order to sell to the defense. So I'm sure that Germany has its own um, requirements in terms of who can sell to defense. But as far as NVIDIA is concerned, um, we have the technology, we are the technology enablers. And when it comes to defense and national security, um, there's lots of applications of AI, be it robotics or drones, um, um, or uh, you know, just monitoring safety, security, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, startups. Actually, NVIDIA has uh, what we call Inception. It's a virtual incubator where we have um, we encourage AI startups to join this virtual incubator um, in order to leverage and take advantage of some of the great work that our NVIDIA researchers are doing and the latest cutting edge using NLP or computer vision. A lot of those applications have a lot of use cases in military and defense. Um, so from... Uh, um, 
uh, you know, the industry standpoint, I, I think definitely that as a technology enabler, um, we encourage AI startups to take advantage of the latest and greatest work we are developing. Very interesting. And in, in your personal opinion, this is also part of the question. Is there any negative connotation, um, at least in the US, when a startup works with the defense sector, or do you not really see that problem? Um, in fact, on the contrary, I think with things like the pandemic and these days now with the uh, uh, climate change and, you know, we are, most of us are in California, we saw the devastation through forest fires here and the need for disaster relief and emergency responders. I think it's even more critical now for uh, more startups to come into this space and provide immediate solutions for things like disaster recovery using things like satellite imagery and, uh, you know, geo intelligence. Very interesting. Yeah, um, Rasmus, I don't know if you have an opinion on defense AI in Germany, if you've seen any other connotations there, but be curious to hear if you have an opinion on this topic. Yeah, I think generally like Germany has been traditionally and also a lot of the, the people in the AI space have been on average much more um, skeptical about working in the space. I think there's been, because of the unfortunate situation with Ukraine, I think there has been a a debate about this topic in the last like you know two months um basically um whether or one and a half months about like you know people being more open towards building companies there and investing but i think it's still a transition i mean it's um yeah it, it will take some time i think um but certainly i think now it's probably more likely that um you can pull a team together and also get investment for such a such an endeavor in, in europe Makes sense. Definitely some recent defense policy changes uh, in Germany as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, we, you know, I think every single panelist has um, expressed an opinion around the fact that yes, regulation and ethics is good, but there is simply no consensus right now. And the most uh, difficult thing about regulation right now is the fact that there is not one single standard or uh, different players have different implementations. Um, and actually we have one question from the panel, um, sorry, not from the panel, from the audience on that as well, which is, you know, the public expects AI to be ethical, um, but when speaking um, to specific ethical questions, there's often no agreement on what behavior should be expected, right? So how can ethical AI be pursued technically in the absence of a political consensus? And what does that mean normatively? We'd be curious to hear whoever uh, can provide some insight uh, to this question. Can I offer a, uh, I'm chickening out uh, answer to that problem? Absolutely, you can. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, there is a standard for ethical design. Uh, IEEE 7000 series is dealing with how do I implement ethical considerations mm -hmm. in the design process. Now, why am I saying I'm chickening out? I'm not answering the question of the ethical results. I'm just um, uh, basically standardizing or suggesting a process where ethical considerations are an integral part of the design process. So basically it says you have to ask questions around ethics and implement it in your design process. Uh, but I'm not telling you how to answer them. Um, so that's basically the best we can do now. And again, then the ethical result, that's uh, a, a tricky one because it does, it does really depend on uh, local preferences and what have you. I mean, the, the, the archetypical trolley problem, you know, which kind of... Uh, you're gonna, the trolley is going to run over the, the, the child or the grandmother, and it really depends on who you're asking in which, uh, in which culture. So we're not going there. We're just saying, please do consider ethical questions in your design, and that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate your answer. Um, Zach, anything else from OpenAI's perspective that would be relevant here to answer this question? Um, I think that the... Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing we can do is expose people to the uh, beauty of AI and the thing. I mean, the, the response to Dolly 2 has been amazing. And I think like what we saw was a lot of people springing to exercise these creative juices that have been locked up in their mind. And I think the like there are, there were so many people who came out to say, wow, this is a new way to express myself. I didn't know that I was this creative. I didn't know that I could do this. And I think the future is going to be filled with these moments and we need to find ways to, um, to, to, br to bring everyone into them um, and to remind people constantly that this is what AI is capable of, of doing. 
Perfect. Thanks, Zach. We have about uh, five minutes left. So um, I just want to address uh, one last question uh, that's coming in from the audience. Um, and then uh, would love for every panelist to share one single learning that they would impart on a current AI founder. But before we get to that, um, the final question from the audience is, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, we talked about skepticism towards AI uh, in different countries. Uh, we heard about this earlier throughout uh, this e event as well. So what are some of the suggestions or thoughts you have to make sure we have less of a public skepticism when it comes to AI? We talked a lot about ethics and regulation, but what can we do to, you know, be positive and actually underline the opportunity that this technology offers? I think it's making also a bit related to what Zach said, like make it concrete and give examples. Like people are very scared of this abstract concept of AI. When they see concrete examples, then, um, you know, it, 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 people realize much more like that it's what it can do and what it cannot do and also where it helps. Like example, healthcare, right? Like if you say like AI and healthcare, like people are scared that there's some AI deciding about their life and death. If you, very abstract, if you tell, tell, tell the general population, hey, look, like you can either go to a doctor that misses like one in five cancers, or you can go to a doctor plus AI that misses just one in hundred cancers, where would you go? Like, that's a very concrete question and the answers will look very different. And um, I think also what, that's why what open AI is doing is great. Like, you know, just showing people, um, you know, what, what AI can do and giving examples and, ex, you know, visualizing that nicely. I think that that really helps it and takes kind of the discussion away from this abstract, like science fiction uh, story of AI. I love it. Move away from the black box and go to something concrete and that people can identify with. Thank you. And like I said, the last question that I have for every panelist, um, one a single piece of advice that you would want to impart on an AI founder. We would love to hear your thoughts on that. Shilpa, would you like to kick it off? Yeah, let me start. Um, I would say um, for the entrepreneurs in the house, um, what problem are you solving that hasn't been solved before? I think that's the most important question. Thank you. That will lead you on the right track. Very clarifying. Thank you. Zach, what, uh, what is your piece of advice? I think uh, there is an inclination in AI to, um, uh, to boil an ocean. Uh, and I think the more specific that you, the, the, and I actually, this is, this is sort of a, uh, follow and answer, but I think the more specific you can make the problem you solve, the better. Um, and uh, for the most part, uh, it seems like founder, the successful founders are doing that starting very niche. Excellent. Thank you. Dick, would love to hear your piece of advice. Um, I think founding is like running a marathon. I mean, either it hurts in training or it hurts during the race, but if it hurts in the race, it hurts more and it makes you slow. So it really comes down to asking the hard question. I mean, involving your customer, Russ was said that, you know, involving the regulator, I said that. Early on in the process, even if you don't like the extra pain and the answer you might be getting, because if you're not doing it early on, it's gonna, again, it's gonna bite you later when it really counts. Great, loving the marathon analogy. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. And Rasmus, what is your one piece of advice for AI founders today? Yeah, just, just start today. Honestly, like, there's so many opportunities, so many problems that are worth solving that you know, make, 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 make the world a better place that make our lives better. And there's so many that are not solved yet. So just get started and then you know, iterate as if things don't work out. Excellent, thank you so much. This concludes our panel. I very much would like to say a big thank you to all the panelists uh, for all the insightful contributions, sharing your diverse experiences and backgrounds uh, with us. I personally learned a ton <laughs> over the last hour or so. Also thank you uh, to the audience for the great questions and of course to the organizers uh, for making this event happen. So thanks so much to everyone for your time. And with this, I will hand it back over to Mieko. Thank you. Thank you, Eva Maria, um, and thank you to all our speakers and panelists for this uh, really insightful and exciting uh, discussions. I also I learned a lot, um, and I uh, it was great that you shared um, how fast IA is developing and uh, how fast adoption is moving, uh, the benefits it's creating, and also some of the exciting developments. And uh, also, uh, I think there's room for uh, continued international cooperation. 
uh, to develop standards and best practices, to create certainty, and also to foster innovation so that we can um, address some of those global challenges. And I also heard that uh, we also need a stakeholder process to increase acceptance in the public and also uh, build a political consensus so that we can build uh, an equitable um, AI and um, can um, share some of the benefits. Um, this event uh, was um, uh, intended to create a platform and to connect the uh, two ecosystems. And uh, we will now have a, a networking element. And I hope you can all join us on wonder.me, uh, where we can further the discussion and build some new connections. And um, my uh, colleagues will post the link here in a second. Um, if you click the link, uh, then it will take you to Wonder. And um, like five easy steps, uh, you will be onboarded and then um, we can uh, extend the discussion and we are uh, looking forward uh, to some more um, insights and new connections. And yeah, I want to thank all our partners again, uh, Berlin partner, the German consulate, all our speakers. And uh, now, yeah, uh, it's time to go over to networking and hopefully you can all join us. Um, thank you. And yeah, I'm looking forward to some more discussion.